Hey, like I said, we're so glad you're here this morning. If we've not gotten a chance to meet yet, my name is Brett, and I get the privilege of serving as the Connections Minister here at East Cobb. Uh, Before we go any further, though, I see so many kids in the room this morning. Don't you love that? I love the 11 a.m. service because we have all of these kids in here, and I'm looking right over here at my friend Noah. Everybody knows Noah over here. I'm singling Noah out because at VBS this last June, it was so much fun because every time I ask a question, little Noah shot his hand in the air right away. I could always count on Noah to answer the question, and it was so much fun. Noah, I'm glad you're here today. But we have so many kids in the room today, and it is so much fun to be able to, to, to worship together as a family. But if you are a parent and you do have kids, please don't worry about it if they're crying in the service. Please don't worry about it if they're running back and forth down the, down the little like uh, track we've got in the back here. In fact, if they need to, if you've got a younger kid and they need to go run, send them back there. Go let them run. Have a good time. Um, really, we are so glad that everybody's in here with us today. So please don't worry if, if your kid is, is making some noise. Um, we're just glad to have you all together. So, as I said, I get the, uh, the privilege to serve as the Connections Minister here, um, and I love that uh, aspect of my job. I love getting the opportunity to connect people with ministries and opportunities uh, that are uh, perfectly suited for their gifting. One of the things I get to do as well, though, is uh, kind of spearhead our small groups ministry here. Um, how many of you have been involved in a small group before? Show of hands. Show of hands. Most people. Wow, this is awesome. I'm going to be preaching to the choir this morning. That's funny. Okay. Um, sorry. So, sorry. I got a little distracted. Um, but we, a, lot, a lot of us have experience with small groups. Um, and I have some personal experience with small groups that makes it more uh, than just a job responsibility for me. Uh, small groups have been a part of my life since I was a little tiny little kid. Okay. I remember every uh, Sunday night, my family would go over to Pam and David Jernigan's house. Okay. See, I remember their names. <laughs> And the kids would go downstairs. We'd have some, somebody watching the kids, um, and the, the adults would, would go upstairs for their, for their study. Every single Sunday night, we were at their house with the same people for many, many years. <laughs> and after the study, all the kids would come upstairs. We'd all eat together. We'd fellowship and have a great, just have a great night together. And even though that small group hasn't met in many, many years, and I was a kid <laughs> when that small group was happening, um, I still stay in pretty close contact with a lot of those people from that group. I still know them, go to them for advice from time to time because of the community that was formed, because of the connection that we shared as a small group. Fast forward a couple years, and I've had the opportunity to lead a couple small groups myself. The, the one of, to me that's of most, most note, it was my youth small group that I led for several years. These guys started at kindergarten, okay? They were kindergartners when I started with them. And when I took a step back from that group, they were uh, going into 10th grade. So I got the opportunity to see them grow up uh, over those 10, 12 years or so um, and got to see those bonds and those relationships grow and build over the years. But then we got to March of 2020. How many of you remember COVID? (laughs) Yes? Okay, a lot of us do. It was not a very much, very fun time for most of us. Um, all of a sudden, we were all involved with our groups. We were all at church regularly, and all of a sudden, we didn't do that anymore. <laughs> we were at home for a little while, and uh, we lost a lot of connection. We lost a lot of those relationships. Um, but a couple months after the world shut down, myself, along with several other college students, uh, those that were, had, had been sent home because their schools were closed, <laughs> decided that we were kind of tired of being isolated. (laughs) We missed our groups. We missed our friendships. Um, So we formed what we called a house church. And it was actually kind of funny because this was just a few months after COVID uh, had started. And so we were still um, very much uh, concerned about uh, about the spread. And uh, (laughs) we got together one night. It was like June, I think, maybe May. Uh, Grace Chapel has this big field out by their parking lot. There's like 20 of us in a socially distanced circle in this field. It was a huge circle. Okay, it was massive. And we all had masks on, and we didn't care because we were just so happy to be able to get back together and enjoy community and fellowship um, as a group. That's how important that small group experience was. And that kind of continued all throughout the rest of, you know, the the lockdown period. And then uh, I kind of stayed involved with that group in various forms um, until about a year and a half ago. And that's when I just kind of uh, retracted from that group a little bit. 
And I retracted from that group and didn't really notice how much I missed it until about a year ago. Six months to a year ago, I realized how much I missed that group. <laughs> I realized just how much I depended on, depended on that group of people to keep me uh, walking in a straight line towards Jesus. <laughs> I didn't realize how much I had depended on that group for community and fellowship and support. And um, just a number of months ago, I decided that something needed to change. But as I was uh, kind of preparing for this and just, just reflecting on that period, Something came to my mind that we often don't cover a lot in, in when we're talking about small groups um, or really church activities in general. We're in, you know, I, I do this myself. We always want you to come to things. We want you to be here. We want you to get involved. But we don't talk about how hard it is to stay in Christian community. Staying in Christian community is not at all easy. Anybody feel that? Staying in Christian community is not easy because we all have crazy lives, right? Let me ask if you, you relate to any of these things. Our schedules are always full. Is your schedule always full? You never have enough time. I see Ugo raising his hand down here. Ugo's involved in like 30,000 things. But he still, he still manages to be here every Sunday and every Sunday night. Our schedules are always full. You have stress at work and at home. Stress at work and at home. It makes you just want to, after, after your day at work or whatever, it makes you just want to go and just detach. Turn off your brain for a little bit and not have to think. And we feel constantly behind. When I feel constantly behind, there, I don't really want to do anything else except for try to get back ahead. <laughs> so when you feel constantly behind, staying connected to this Christian community is really difficult because it's so easy to retract. It's so easy to say, hey, I'm just not going to go this week. I'm just going to stay home. I'm going to go to sleep or I'm going to work a little bit extra. And before you know it, like me, you realize that you're completely disconnected. And all of these things come down to the fact that we're all busy. We're so busy that we get disconnected. We're so busy that we push aside what's most important. We push aside the things that are really going to feed into our lives and the things that are really going to allow us to experience the richness that Jesus provides. There's a, uh, there's, a, there's a study that came out from the Harvard Business Review. Um, I know it sounds kind of boring, but it's, this is actually really fun, Okay. It said, academic research suggests that our days are becoming increasingly jam-packed. That's not news to anybody. Is that news to anybody in here? It's not news to me. But this, is, this is good. They said, one analysis of holiday letters indicates that references to crazy schedules have risen dramatically in holiday letters since the 1960s. So I have this picture of researchers sitting down with a bunch of holiday letters for like 50 years and just reading through them and marking down how many times people reference crazy schedules. <laughs> I find it kind of, kind of amusing, but uh, just everybody is, is, is saying how crazy their world is, how busy they are. They go on to say that um, some Gallup data that they analyzed said that a, per a percentage of employed Americans that were reporting that they never had enough time rose from 70% to 80% in 20, from 2011 to 2018. I know 10% doesn't necessarily seem like a lot, but let's focus on the fact that 80% of people surveyed said they didn't have enough time. 80% of people surveyed who have who are employed in the U.S. said they did not have enough time. <laughs> that's just crazy. That's, that's crazy. You don't have enough time to do what really matters. We are all busy, and we're all really busy. <laughs> and there, um, it, it causes us to retract. It causes us to pull back from the things that are most important and to just focus on what's most urgent. It causes us to focus on the things that are right in front of us instead of what's actually going to make our lives better. There's a book that I reference pretty frequently, and I've taught on it before. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Uh, Boanne's laughing at me here because I've talked to her about it several times. Um, but I've taught on it multiple times because it's such a life-changing book for me, and I'll be the first one to tell you I struggle applying the principles of the book. But uh, the author, he quotes a theologian, um, John Ortberg. He says, for many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. I th think I can comfortably say that about most of us in this room. The great danger is not that we're going to renounce our faith. The great danger is that we're going to become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it, it being our faith. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. And that quote kind of like hit me <laughs> when I reread it recently. It hit me when I reread it recently because I see myself doing this. 
I see myself getting so distracted and rushed and preoccupied with all of the urgency in life and settling for just a you know, lower level of faith, settling for the Christian life that's not actually what Jesus promised us. And I find myself just kind of skimming over the top of life, just kind of rushing through everything as fast as I can and not actually investing in what matters. We're all busy. This quote from Corey Ten Boom, J- Boom just like emphasizes that even more. He says that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. How many of you feel that? I do. <laughs> the devil has made our society so, so busy that it's not necessarily required to make us actually sin. <laughs> it's just enough to crowd out all of the things that matter so that we don't ever experience the life that Jesus gave us. We're all really, really busy. But something that I, I found personally, just over my journey over the last six to eight months of discovering my disconnectedness, is really the concept that we're all, we all know, we're all familiar with, but it's that God designed our lives to be connected. He designed us to be in community with other people. And I don't mean surface level community. I don't mean just like passing somebody in the grocery store and giving that, you know, that nod thing that we all do in the grocery store. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not even talking about community here when you see somebody in the hallway and you say, hey, how you doing? And they say, good, how are you? And you say, good, then you don't talk to each other for a week. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about deep community. I'm talking about deep connection. I'm talking about community where you know what the other person's going through. I'm talking about community where you know what the other person needs and you are committed to helping fill them. I mean community where we're all strengthening each other to become stronger followers of Jesus. God designed us to be connected, and that's why I believe that everybody in our church should be involved in a small group in some form. Everybody in this room, everybody in our church should be involved in a small group in some form. I know we're all busy. I know we've all got full schedules, but I believe that everyone in this room should be involved in a small group and that everyone in this room can be involved in a small group because we all make decisions about our schedules and we prioritize what's most important. And if small groups are most important, I believe that everybody can be involved in a small group. So this morning, I want to give you three reasons. Can I give you three reasons this morning? Three reasons why I believe everybody needs to be in a small group. And these reasons are actually really personal to me because they're, they're the three things that I missed most about not being in a small group. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of reasons why you should be involved in a small group, but these three are personal to me, and they really are the things that I just missed in my life when I decided to get disconnected, when I, when I decided to retract from my group and try to do things on my own. First, though, before I get into those three reasons, I want to share with you really why as Christians, why as the modern 21st century church, we want to be connected. We want to be in groups. We want to be doing life together. And if you've ever read the book of Acts, you'll know in the beginning we see a beautiful picture of church life. We see a beautiful picture of a group of people that are doing life so closely together that they literally see each other every day. They fill each other's needs. They break bread together. We can, we can read this in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. This is what Kelechi read for us just a minute ago. Um, it, Luke writes, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's an amazing picture, isn't it? That's an amazing picture of Christian community. (laughs) Let's, Let's just, let's walk through this for just a second. Let's go back here. We start off with them describing how they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the principles that the apostles were teaching them, to living them out. They devoted themselves to breaking of the bread and to prayer, to remembering the mission of Jesus and to praying for God's kingdom to come on earth. They were together and they had everything in common. This next part is just, if I'm being honest with you, is one of the just most amazing things about this passage. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need so nobody in their community 
didn't have enough. Nobody with their in, within their community was without because they shared everything. Every day they met together in the temple courts. And what was the result of all of that? What was the result of all that? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They were in such tight community. They were in such close fellowship that everybody wanted a part of it. Everybody wanted to hear what was going on. Everybody wanted to hear why these people were so close together. And the power of God was at work in them. And a lot of, uh, you know, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking about this gathering, thinking about this church, right? When you read Acts 2, you're thinking about the church. And that's true, the church. This should describe our church as a whole. But I believe that when we get into small groups, when we invest in small community, I'm talking about 10 to 15 other Christians, I believe we can experience this on a whole new level. I believe we can experience this in a way that is deep and personal and in a way that changes our lives every single day. That's what I experienced, and that's what I think you can experience if you choose to invest in a group. So I told you I was going to give you three reasons, okay? Three very simple reasons why I think you should be in a small group and three reasons why I think, what well, three things that I missed when I was not in a group. Let's get into those. Number one, intimate community. We see this in Acts chapter 2. We see their tight-knit fellowship. We see them sharing everything they have. We see them meeting together every single day and praying together. We see this tight and intimate community. And I highlighted the word intimate for a very specific reason. Because this right here is community. The close to 500 people that we have on our membership roles here, that's community, okay? But that's 500 people. Have you ever had intimate relationships with 500 people? I don't, I, I don't even think that's possible, really. <laughs> but intimate community is different. Intimate community is you're in a circle with 10 to 15 people, and you know what's going on in their lives. You know what they're struggling with. You know their family situation. You know what they need, and you're committed to helping them fill it. Everybody in the group is committed to that. You're committed to caring for one another no matter what. You're going to sell your property and possessions to care for those in your group who have a need. That's intimate community. That's what, um, that's what a small group can provide. Number two, mutual accountability. Okay, I want a show of hands here. How many of you have a positive view of the word accountability? A few. That's great. I'm glad some of you got, are already, already on the same page. A lot of the times accountability is seen as a negative thing. It's seen as something that you don't really want. It's seen as something that is just kind of just kind of a downer, honestly. <laughs> you don't want somebody checking up on you and making sure you're doing what you're supposed to do. But in a small group <coughs> setting, the mutual accountability that's provided by members of a group is one of the most valuable things for me as a Jesus follower. <coughs> this group of people that is committed to doing life together, living out the Christian faith together, and committed to calling out other members of their group who aren't doing what they say they're going to do. This is a group that helps us all stay on track. This is, this is accountability that helps us ensure that we're living out the faith that we profess. And just on a, on a personal level, um, with some just sin struggles that we all deal with, we all have those sin struggles that we just can't seem to kick on our own. Some of the, 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 the most incredible transformation that I've experienced in my life has been in the context of a small group because of mutual accountability, because I had people checking up on me, because I had people making sure that I was actually doing what I said I was going to do, and that I was following through on the Christian life that I professed. Mutual accountability. This really is one of the most powerful things about a small group. Number three, intentional sharpening. Intentional sharpening. I don't know if any of you are like me, okay, but I often have trouble learning by myself. I often have trouble learning by myself because I can read from a book, I can read from a study, but all I have is my own perspective. All I have is my own knowledge to back that up. Whereas when I'm in a group and I'm studying a passage of scripture, I'm studying a gospel, or I'm studying maybe just an extra biblical resource, I get so much value from hearing from wisdom of other people and how other people are breaking down, how other people are understanding the, the content that we're reading. I don't know if any, any of you feel that as well, but like I get so much richness out of my study when I'm doing it with other people. When I'm sitting in a group with somebody who may be further along in life than I am, who can provide me more wisdom on Acts chapter 2 than I already have, broadens my horizon, allows me to understand the character and the nature of God and his kingdom in a better way. But even on top of that, intentional sharpening involves 
helping us become better Christians, <laughs> helping us become better at doing what we've been called to do, helping us to be better at serving the community around us, helping us to be better at growing together. Intentional sharpening means Christians doing life together, sharing wisdom with one another, and helping each other become better Jesus followers. Number one, intimate community, mutual accountability, and intentional sharpening. When I disconnected from a group for a while, I had a kind of an epiphany about a year after that, where I realized I didn't really have an intimate community. I had a community. I had people that I was close with and friends with, but I didn't really have that intimate group community. I didn't really have mutual accountability. Again, I had people that were checking in on me, but I didn't have that regular group setting where I was accountable to the other members of the group. And I didn't have intentional sharp... I I wasn't being intentionally sharpened or helping to intentionally sharpen anybody else. I was just kind of (laughs) there. I was just kind of walking through life. I was trying to do the best I could. I allowed the busyness of my schedule to overwhelm the most important things which really are these three. (laughs) An intimate community of Jesus followers, mutual accountability among the body, and the intentional sharpening of one another. I had allowed my busy schedule to get in the way. And just honestly, I work work at a church, okay? (laughs) And I allowed my busy schedule to get in the way of these three things. So I know that it's a mutual thing for all of us. We all get so busy that we choose to miss out. Maybe not choose, but we end up missing out on these three things. We end up missing out on the rich community that Jesus promises us and the rich community that we see in the book of Acts. And really, all of this stuff boils down to one thing for us as Jesus followers. What is this all about? What is everything we're doing in this room all about? It's about fulfilling the mission that Jesus left us. It's about fulfilling the Great Commission, which is to go and make disciples of all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what this is all about. So when we talk about intimate community, mutual accountability, and intentional sharpening, all of these things are working towards the end of sharing the gospel with the nations, allowing us to become better Christians so that we can more effectively spread the news around the world. And I just found (laughs) that when I was not involved in a group, I was not being very effective at carrying out the mission personally in my life. I needed other Christians to help spur me along the way. There's a humbling verse in Matthew chapter 7. Um, if you ever read, this, read the Sermon on the Mount, you've probably read this and gone, ooh, that's kind of that's humbling too. It's Matthew chapter 7. Um, Jesus says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. And that hit me in a different way recently. It hit me in a personal way. It wasn't just like, oh, all those people, right, that don't believe in in Jesus. It hit, hit me in a way where I was like, is that me? Am I calling out, Lord, Lord, I prophesy in your name, but I'm not actually living the life that Jesus calls us to live? Am I just skimming over the surface of life and not actually tapping into what Jesus called me to do? And I really felt that in a different way because this is all coming down to accomplishing that mission that Jesus calls us, doing the will of our Father in heaven, and there will be a day when we are all going to be judged. We're all, we're all going to be judged. And I'm afraid that there's going to be a lot of people <laughs> who are going to call out, Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name. And Jesus is going to say, did you do the will of your Father in heaven? Or did you just, did you just say the words? Did you just say good things? <laughs> did you actually carry out the will of my Father in heaven, and I found that when I'm not doing life together with other Christians, when I'm not doing life together in an intimate community, I can kind of drift along the along the path of just living on the surface, not going deep into what God called us to do, not actually living the life that God has called me to. So the bottom line this morning is that doing life together helps you to do life better, 
Going even further, doing life together helps us accomplish the mission. And just to be clear, when I say doing life together helps you do life better, I don't mean that you're going to have, you, when you join a small group, you're going to get like a new car or a lot of money and a raise at work and everything's going to go great in your life. Actually, it's probably not. <laughs> you're still going to have trials. You're still going to have troubles. You're still going to have bad days. But you're going to be doing it in the life, in, in, in the context of a community. You're going to have a people, a group of people around you that's committed to helping you do life better. It's committed to helping all of us become better followers of Jesus. And by extension, helping us accomplish the mission that Jesus laid out for us. And just once again, that mission is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Said a different way in, in, during the Sermon on the Mount, we are the light of the world, a city on a hill. <laughs> our mission is to make disciples. Our mission is to do the will of our Father in heaven. And I believe with everything in me that doing that, 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 being involved in a small group, being in the context of other people helps you along that path. Having accountability to one another for what you say you're gonna do, having intimate community, sharing life together and intentionally sharpening each other helps you along the way to fulfilling that mission. Because Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could be in heaven with him and paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could partner with him to bring goodness onto this planet. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could have a right relationship with God. Humanity ruined it. <laughs> Humanity ruined it. And Jesus paid that ultimate price so that we could be in right standing with God. And he calls all of us to partner with him to spread that good news to the nations. So I'm going to give you an opportunity in just uh, about a week to get involved in a group. Because truly, I believe that groups will help your spiritual growth. They'll catalyze your spiritual growth. It'll help you become more like Jesus. So in a week, I'm going to give you an opportunity to join a group. You may be asking, why a week? Why not right now? Because I don't want you to make a decision right now. I don't want you to decide whether or not you can join a group right now. Because all of the excuses are going to flood in like they do with me. You're going to look at your calendar and you're going to go, oh no, I don't know when I'm going to fit that in. I, I, I don't want you to think about that. I want you to take this next week or more if you need it. I want you to pray about it. I want you to ask God for his guidance. I want you to talk to your spouse. I want you to make a plan for how you can get involved in a group, whether it's one of our organized small groups or something you do on your own. Every one of us needs a group of Christians that we do life with. So right now, if, you, if you'd like, you can go to eastcobcoc.org slash groups, um, and you'll see kind of, you'll be able to see some of the open groups that we have. We've got six or seven with openings right now um, that'll, be, that'll be opening up next week. But if there's not a group that matches the time that you need to meet, or maybe your age of life, or your stage of life or demographic, there's also a form where you can request a group. And we'd love to start one in your area because it is such an important thing for you to be involved in a group with other Christians. And many of you are already involved in small groups. That's awesome. I need your help, okay? I want everybody in our church involved in a group. And if you're already in a small group, I want you to help me get those that are not involved in a small group involved in a small group. Deal? Yes? Okay. Seriously, I don't, I risk, I, I don't think I can overstate it. Being a part of a small group has the potential to change your life, has the potential to make you a better Jesus follower, and has the potential to just help you go deeper in your, in your walk with Jesus. And I don't want you to miss that. I don't want you to let the busyness of life get in the way of you experiencing this rich community. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this group of people that has come here today to, to uh, engage in Christian community together. Thank you for um, this church and everyone that's here that just <laughs> goes out um, in their lives and spreads the gospel to their communities and their families. I pray that you help us to not get so caught up in the busyness of our lives that we miss the most important things, that we miss the community that you've created for us, that we miss the mission that you've called us to. I ask for you to help us to, to just clear our minds and think about what is most important and how we can serve you better. God, I thank you so much for everything you've done for us, and it's your name we pray. Amen.